Ancient Greek has a word which is preserved today in English in the transliterated form. That just means we say it the same way, we just use different letters to spell it. Uh, the meaning is roughly the same as it was then. The Greek word, martar, being easily recognizable in English as the word martyr. In ancient Greek, a martar was a witness. When Christians were persecuted for their faith, those who were killed became, became known as martyrs. Their deaths were certainly a witness or a testimony to their faith, and also a witness to those who would later believe in Jesus, in part because of the way in which the martyrs faced torture and death. One of the most famous Christian martyrs, aside from Jesus and the apostles, was an early church apologist who was put to death during the Roman persecution of that growing Christian movement in about AD 165. History knows Justin by the surname Martyr, Justin Martyr. He's known as Saint Justin Martyr to Catholic and Orthodox Christians. After his arrest, Justin was offered a chance to walk away from his faith he need only sacrifice to the Roman gods. He replied, No one who is rightly minded turns from true belief to false. When threatened with death after that refusal, Justin said in response, If we are punished for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we hope to be saved. At this point, Justin and his followers, it wasn't just him, were taken outside and all beheaded. Throughout the history of the people of God, whether we're talking about Joseph, or David, Daniel, or Elijah, or more recently Stephen and then Justin, or John Wycliffe, or Jan Hus, or even Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or if we're talking about Rahab, or Esther, about Mary, or Felicitas, or, Perpe or Perpetua, or Edith, or Edith Stein, whoever we're talking about, when the people of God faced trials and tribulations, or the threat of certain death. They have relied upon their faith, of course, upon their fellow believers, and on prayer. For some, trouble came to them not leaving much time to prepare because it was sudden. For others, the storm clouds were brewing on the horizon for some time, allowing them time to prepare for the ordeal to come. Some of those that I mentioned were protected by God, even miraculously so, like Daniel, others paid for their devotion to God, becoming martyrs with their very lives. To be able to stand firmly in faith when life itself is on the line requires a firmly rooted faith. And as Jesus himself so famously demonstrated before his passion began, while in the Garden of Gethsemane, it takes prayer. That will be our focus this morning, Jesus' prayer in the garden, beginning in Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse 36, looking just at verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Jesus and his disciples had just finished, take, finished taking the Passover meal together. This is the evening of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. To make it easier for us to remember what's what, we'll simply refer to it as Thursday. So on Thursday evening of Holy Week, Jesus goes with his disciples. At this particular Passover, Jesus celebrated it in Jerusalem along with the Twelve. At that meal, he instituted what his followers would later call Holy Communion or Eucharist, by declaring that the bread was his body and the cup of wine was his blood, the blood of a new covenant. Also at that same meal, known thereafter as the Last Supper, Jesus predicted the betrayal of Judas, although he didn't single him out, and the denial of Peter, after which Peter boldly declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never desert you. The next two times we look at the Gospel of Matthew, we'll be looking at Peter and Judas. So following that emotional, symbolic, and consequential meal, 
Jesus led his disciples out of the city, across the Kidron Valley, to an olive orchard, which also had an olive press in it for making olive oil. That's what the name Gethsemane means. Jesus' intention in taking that late night walk with his 11 closest followers, remember that Judas has already left them, was made clear by him when he told them to wait for him while he prayed. Jesus purposefully came to this place at this time with these people to pray. He could have prayed in the room that they ate the meal in. After all, the Gospel of John records a lengthy and beautiful prayer that Jesus gave in association with that meal. He could have prayed earlier in the day or later, and we know that Jesus did both. Jesus could have prayed alone, as he often did. He often spent time in a solitary place praying. But there was something about what he knew was coming in the next 24 hours that propelled Jesus to seek a few hours outside the city with his disciples near him so that he could pray. In a moment, we will look at what Jesus prayed and why he prays that way. For now, let us simply note that Jesus intended to pray. He put that intention into action. He is here on purpose. Now, I've competed in cross-country races ranging from 5Ks to 50Ks. It goes all the way back to the late 80s, and I still do it. I know full well what I intend to do when I start a race. It's not always what actually happens. Sometimes I get muscle cramps, a side stitch, a leg ache. Sometimes the course conditions, the, the cold or the rain or, or whatever, get in the way. And sometimes it's simply the competition itself is too difficult. It ru ruins my hopes and my plans. But at the same time, if I didn't properly prepare before the race started, by eating the right thing leading up to it, by hydrating properly, by getting enough sleep the night before, by wearing the right shoes and the right clothes, by warming up the right way, there's a lot of things you need to do properly before. If I didn't do it all before I started, I wouldn't stand a chance of reaching my goals. If I do everything right beforehand and everything lines up properly, I might still fail to achieve my desired time, or I might not win my age bracket or whatever my goal is. But at least I will have done everything I could do beforehand to prepare. In case you're wondering, distance running is not one of those things you just hop out of bed and do without preparation. It doesn't work that way. Prayer during a crisis is crucial. But it still will never be all it can be without prayer before a crisis to be its foundation. They say that there are no atheists in a foxhole. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm sure you've heard that. But shouldn't you be on a first-name basis with God before people start shooting at you? Isn't that a little bit late to say, hey God, it's me, and to start praying? If you only pray when you really need to pray, it may be a case of too little too late to help you in that crisis. Jesus chose to pray after his meal in which they praised God for the Passover. And he fellowshiped with his disciples at that meal. After that, he chose to pray before his time of trial began. Because Jesus knew the time of his trial. He was able, uh, and he knew it was at hand, he was able to devote specific time to preparing for it in prayer. We don't know our future, in case you're wondering. We need to make prayer then a regular habit, not unlike eating well, not unlike exercise. We don't wait until, we shouldn't wait, you shouldn't wait, until you have a heart attack to think about maybe laying off the french fries and try jogging once in a while. Once you've had the heart attack, it may be too late. Preparing for the future thus begins now with prayer. First half of verse 37 says this, He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. Of the eleven, why those three? 
This isn't the first time that Peter, James, and John were singled out. Jesus also took that same trio up the mountain with him for the transfiguration. As you read the Gospels, it becomes evident that the relationship between Peter, uh, excuse me, between Jesus and Peter, James, and John is beyond that of a teacher and his students. These four are also friends. Jesus wanted his friends close by as he went to the garden to pray. The trial that he knew would begin shortly would push Jesus to his limits, physically, mentally, and spiritually, to face back that which he knew was coming. He knew he was going to face it alone. He needed to fortify himself with effective prayer beforehand. And for that prayer to be effective, Jesus wanted his closest friends by him at his side. Second half of 37 and 38. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. We'll consider the cause of this sorrow in the next several verses. For now, let us consider its extent. Sorrow, along with anxiety and fear and pain, are a part of life. Life in a fallen world inhabited by people that are in rebellion against God. We all will experience each of them at times, in various degrees and for various durations. Thinking back on your life, you can probably point to your worst sorrow, your worst anxiety or fear or pain, the worst moment or time of that that you've experienced thus far in your life. As painful as that memory of that time might be, we know that it did not overwhelm you, that it did not destroy you, for you are sitting here still amongst the living. What lay ahead for Jesus was beyond anything that is possible in normal human experience. I certainly do not wish to minimize in any way the horrors of human suffering, the physical and emotional toll that those who have experienced the worst of it have endured is by God's grace beyond my own personal knowledge. But even so, Jesus knew he would also face a spiritual element beyond the physical, beyond the emotional, a spiritual element that would be unique in the history of the world. So Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to stay nearby, to watch over him while he communed with his heavenly Father in prayer. What Jesus said to his Father will shed light on why his sorrow, considering the day to come, was so profound. So let's see what Jesus said. It says this, verse 39, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. He fell to the ground with his face to the ground and prayed. The typical posture of respect for a Jewish person to pray is to stand with one's head covered. They usually, the men especially, would have a prayer shawl for that purpose. It's a way of respectful prayer. On this night, however, Jesus' legs apparently could not support him. His body was too weak to stand and to pour out his soul at the same time in prayer. After finishing that first 50K three years ago, I was dehydrated enough that it was difficult to stand. I was, uh, I was a little bit uh, lightheaded. My legs were cramping. It was unpleasant. I had a hard time walking for quite some time as I rested. It really didn't get better until I had eaten something. For about an hour later, it really started to get better. Well, Jesus has not yet faced the upcoming physical abuse that he is going to face. That physical abuse will cause him to fall to the ground, unable to carry his cross any further. But emotionally, his body does not have the strength to stand and pray. He falls to the ground. He says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Now this is Jesus. 
the eternal Word of God, become incarnate, taking on human flesh, precisely for this very purpose and no other. He came to do that which only God could himself do, following the plan of the Father that was settled before even the world was created. And he came knowing that the only, that only his vicarious death could bring that plan to its completion. Jesus also knew that the reconciliation of humanity with God rested upon his willingness and his ability to follow this plan to its bitter end. So you might be wondering, why ask a question you already know the answer to? Well, there are a few possible explanations. I'm going to point out three of them. First off, we know that in his humanity, Jesus willingly set aside some of the prerogatives of being God during his time on earth. Perhaps that also included some self-imposed limitations on Jesus' knowledge, such that maybe he actually was asking the question in the hopes that there might be an alternative, a path he wasn't aware of. A second explanation is this. Perhaps it is a simple question of the experience of living in time and space, of knowing uh, firsthand what pain and suffering really feel like. Maybe that's what prompted Jesus to ask that the cup be removed, even though he knew it could not. In our human frailty, we are not immune to asking questions in order to try to spare ourselves from suffering even though our mind already knows the answer. So perhaps it was Jesus' emotional response to ask the question his mind already knew the answer to. Or maybe this might be the explanation. Maybe it was instead not the suffering that lay ahead that caused Jesus' legs to weaken and his heart to tremble. Maybe it was the reality of facing death. A death apart from his heavenly Father, a death alone on a cross, a death where he would have to rely in his humanity on faith. Faith that he would indeed be victorious over sin and death like the plan said. Faith that he would rise again and not be forever separated from God. Forever stained with the sin that he would bear. I'm not sure which of those or what combination or maybe even something else. We don't know exactly what's in Jesus' mind. How could we know? We have a hard enough time understanding our own minds. And certainly, we can't quite understand Jesus and how he fully combines humanity and deity. We don't know exactly why Jesus asked the question, per se. It's enough to know that the prospect of the upcoming trial to come was so daunting, so frightening, so anxiety-filling, that Jesus was willing to ask God for a reprieve from it. Before we continue, notice the metaphor that he uses. Jesus calls his trial a cup, one that he alone must drink, and he must drink all of it down to the bitter dregs. That cup contains all of the wrath of God, the righteous punishment earned by the deeds of humanity through countless acts of rebellion against God and evil perpetrated against our fellow man. It is a cup filled with hate and greed and lust and envy and pride and every other form of unholiness uh, devised by the darkened heart of people that are enslaved to sin. You or I could not withstand a sip from that cup, even though we are, all are all already, even though we are all already sinners. We've all earned our own condemnation, and we deserve the wrath of a holy God. Jesus, in comparison, his mind was pure, his spirit clean, his heart free from that stain. If you would recoil, recoil at the thought of you yourself becoming a murderer or a rapist or a child abuser, imagine the horror to Jesus of taking upon his own shoulders even for only a few hours on the cross, the guilt and the shame of billions of people having sinned trillions of times. We couldn't drink a cup filled only with our own sin and survive it. It would kill us. Jesus faced the certainty that in less than a day, he would face a nearly infinitely greater task. The physical and emotional suffering of the cross was immense. 
It was a cruel torture device invented by evil men, but it was only the tip of the iceberg. The far greater part of Jesus' ordeal lay below the surface, in the spiritual realm, as the wrath of God would be poured forth upon him. No wonder the sun refused to shine during those hours. No wonder that it, once it was over, Jesus gave up his own life willingly. In the end, Jesus ended this prayer with obedience to the will of the Father. He resolved to be the Savior of the world, and that was, excuse me, that resolve to be the Savior of the world was tested, but he remained firm, just as he had when Satan te tempted him in the wilderness. Verses 40 and 41. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Having previously promised to die for Jesus if need be, Peter is asked why he couldn't simply watch while his friend and teacher prayed. Now, some people take time to criticize the disciples for their numerous failures from this point on in the story until Jesus puts Thomas's doubts to rest after the, the resurrection. There's plenty of material if you want to get after the disciples for their failures, and they deserve perhaps some criticism. But I've always wondered how many of us would do any better. These are difficult hours for anyone to face. Not understanding the importance of the day to come, they don't know what the next day is bringing. The disciples' emotional state is not equal to that of their master. And so Jesus says to them, watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now these words of Jesus here to his disciples, knowing the danger that they would themselves would face between Thursday night and Sunday morning, and the heartache, the doubt that would assault them after his betrayal and after his death. These are extremely appropriate words by Jesus. Watch and pray that you not fall into temptation. They needed to pray. They needed to be on their guard against temptation. The words of Jesus here are also timeless. The people of God always need to watch and pray. We must always be on our guard against temptation. Some days, you're going to need that more immediately and more acutely than others, but it never really goes away. As long as we must still, excuse me, as long as we must still contend against our own sinful nature, as long as we, even if we do have the Holy Spirit within us, even if we know that our victory in the end is assured, that battle is still continuing. It is still waging in our hearts and minds. As long as we dwell here on this earth, among our fellow men and women who are members of that same fallen race, we will continue to face temptation. We will need to be watchful and pray. Even though we have the Spirit of God within us, it has been given to us, at, excuse me, given to all believers since Pentecost. That spirit is willing and ready to conform to the law of God. That spirit is humble and obedient. Our own human nature, however, remains weak. We can and we should reg regularly overcome te temptation. We should have victory. It is expected of the disciples of Jesus. We cannot follow Jesus and remain mired in our sin. But it will, at times, be a struggle, primarily against our own weaknesses. All the more reason to lean, as the song says, upon the everlasting arms in prayer. Verse 42. When he went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. The will of God for us in general is laid out in great detail in his word. We all know what his will is for us in general. That's not hard for us to understand. The will of God for us specifically, for me in my life right now, can be difficult to be assured of, to really know and be assured of. But our attitude regarding the will of God ought to be the same no matter how confident we are in our understanding of God's will. Our attitude should always be, your will be done. 
We call ourselves God's people for a reason. It denotes not only God's leadership of us and his lordship over us, but God's ownership of us as well. We belong, literally, to God, as does everyone else, whether they know it or not, but we acknowledge God as our creator, as our redeemer, our sustainer, as our judge. We welcome that state of affairs. We praise God for that state of affairs. It is not then for us to gainsay the will of God. We can be confused by God's will. We can be emotionally torn up about it. But in the end, we as the people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb must submit ourselves to the will of God. It's worth noting for our own encouragement, given our weaknesses, that Jesus returned to pray a second time about the same thing. Even though he ended the first prayer, not as you will, but at, excuse me, not as I will, but as you will. He already said it. And yet he goes back and says it again. Nobody is calling it easy to submit to the will of God in all things. Some areas of your life are easy. It's easy for you to conform that area to the will of God. But other areas, other things are difficult. And sometimes it might be a real knockdown, drag out fight for you to submit to the will of God. So if you need to return to prayer again and again to bring your will under that of God, then pray again and again, then do it. Because we can't give up and decide to live with our rebellion, with our sin, and say, oh, I can't win. We need to keep fighting until victory is won. We'll end the text with verses 43. Oh, no, I'm sorry, we're not there yet. 43 and 44. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away one more, once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. We don't know about the eight other disciples that were left somewhere by the entrance, but Peter, James, and John were simply too tired to stay awake. In a few moments, they're going to be confronted by an armed crowd. At that point, their adrenaline is going to fill their bodies, and they're going to be wide awake again, awake enough, awake enough for them to successfully run home and hide. For now, however, they're sleeping. So Jesus leads them in praise a third time. Jesus chooses to not awaken them and rebuke them a second time. Instead, he lets them sleep and returns to his own urgent need. Jesus brought his disciples along. He needed their companionship as he fortified himself with prayer, but their inability to actively contribute to help him foreshadowed the road that he would walk from this point, from the garden to Calvary, a road Jesus would face entirely alone. The third time Jesus prayed the same thing as the first two times. Really, what else was there for him to pray about at this time? We don't know everything that Jesus said. We're assuming that he's praying here for something like an hour or more. Matthew only gives us three sentences, and the third sentence is a repetition of the first two. His words, though, boil down to that one thought. Have your way, Father, if it is the only way. Well, it was the only way, and the will of the Father did come to fulfillment. To God be the glory, certainly, for that. For that plan of salvation is what redeemed us all from hell. 45 and 46 to finish. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Having fortified himself and strengthened his resolve through the fellowship of those he loved and through intense communication with his heavenly Father, Jesus now rises to go and meet his passion head on. Once his course was set, once it was firmly established and now begun, Jesus made not a single effort to, de to, to deviate from the plan. No attempt to look for a way out. It was for this purpose and this hour that he came into the world. To that purpose, he will hold true. In our lives, we will face danger. We will face toils, and we will face snares. We will face sorrow, 
pain, and ultimately death. These things will come whether you are prepared for them or not. What we do to prepare for them ahead of time is our responsibility. Jesus chose to spend his last hour before his passion began in gut-wrenching prayer. It was a wise use of that time. I don't know when I will face adversity next. I don't know when you will. It would be foolish of us to remain unprepared for that day. So let us then commit ourselves to practicing the habit of taking our cares and our worries to our Heavenly Father in prayer, of laying them down there at the throne of grace, and continuing to bend our will in conformity with His. When trouble comes, pray, and keep on praying through it. But also learn wisdom from Jesus. Pray before trouble comes to you.